January 2014 started out as a normal day for Kelly Garner. That is until a light dusting of snow, which we're fairly familiar with in Canada, suddenly turned into a major ice storm that crippled most of central Alabama, which usually doesn't get that stuff. Kelly ventured out, be a good Samaritan, see if he could help someone, uh, anyone, out on Highway 31 because it was traffic mayhem. And having lived with diabetes for over 40 years, being out like this on a day like that was not a good combination. Kelly actually went into a severe state of hypoglycemia and fell off a cliff uh, off a highway, plummeting 40 feet, landing on a boulder, and somewhat miraculously lived to tell the story. Kelly's book is called The Night That Changed Our Lives, and he's here with me now in studio. So glad you're able to actually be here. That wasn't a uh, an, a likely outcome to that scenario, was it, Kelly? It, it was not. It's, it's so good to be here with you. <laughs> well, I'll bet it is. So take us back to that day, to that moment in January of 2014, and tell us what led up to it, what happened, and tell us the story. Well, I decided to go out to the highway and, and check on the conditions that were going on. And when I get there, there's hundreds of people out volunteering, helping okay. people. Because, like, when you get snow in Alabama, it's a big deal, right? It's a big deal for us. Right. So you don't typically see snow? I don't see snow a lot. <laughs> so people don't have snow tires. I mean, there's no sanders, salters. Nope. It's not like you would see in Canada where we're generally well prepared for it. It's right. We're so it was a bit of an emergency. Ready. It was. So you decided to, were you on the road or did you just decide to go out and, like, help? Yeah, I just went out to check on my own car because we got stuck going into the neighborhood. So I go out and check on it. And when I was there, that's when I see uh, just a disaster taking place right in front of my eyes. You know, it was just Armageddon-like. You know, it was really crazy to see people just walking around in a daze because that's how shocking it is for us to have yeah. this kind of... So was there like a pile-up? Is that what happened? There was it was a, yeah, ma just ma major congestion building up, and, and one car might make it up the, the incline, the hill itself, mm -hmm. and then others uh, could not follow behind that person. And then all of a sudden it just kind of triggered and, and set off a, a chain reaction behind the other cars behind it. Wow. Well, we are familiar with that. We call them pile-ups here. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what happened? You went out trying to be a good Samaritan. To help people? I was uh, out and uh, I had not eaten. By the time the, the end of the day had taken place, it had been 22 hours since I had anything to eat or drink. Oh, wow. And not a good combination for someone with diabetes. And mm -hmm. so all the pushing and, and doing the things we were doing that day, uh, my, I just bottomed out. And that's when, instead of going left or right, go back into my neighborhood, I decided to go straight for whatever reason. And that straight was a drop off. Now, I've had some very good friends who have had type 1 diabetes, and so what happens is, if, correct me if I'm wrong, your blood sugar gets very low, and it impacts your ability to even process information. Your thought process sort of gets short-circuited, does it not? It does. It's, it's a, a, much like a drunken stupor. Okay. You know, I just really just don't know what's going on and, and start talking silly talk. And, yeah. And I'm just... Uh, not even knowing where I am or anything. So you lost awareness, you got disoriented, and then what happened? Well, that's when I went straight off the cliff, and uh, I don't recall anything that, that happened. By the time I got to the sidewalk, instead of going left or right, I went straight, and at that point, I don't remember anything wow. that took place. So how long were you there for when you fell off? Well, tell us, how deep was the cliff? It was about a 40-foot drop, and wow. I stayed there for close to somewhere between 12 to 14 hours in 8-degree weather, and that's where all the miracles took place. <laughs> I mean, it was just phenomenal so what, what did happened. did people see you fall off the cliff? No or? one saw it. No one, no one saw it. No one saw it. It was, uh, I was pretty much AWOL. I was missing. Wow. And I call it my lost day on January 28th, 2014, my found day on January 29th of 14. So you were there overnight in a, in a blizzard, and what happened? Uh, my neighbors had a search party out the next morning, and this is where just all the, uh, the, the love and for mankind and a whole different perspective of life came in for me is where everyone just pitched in and helped little old me. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't expecting anything like this to happen and nor did I expect anyone to, to have to look for me. And, and, and here I was and my neighbors did a search party and they found me. And uh, that's how, how long did it take for someone to realize that you were missing? Well, my, my boys and my wife knew I was not sounding too good over the phone. So they knew by my voice that 
I was not quite there. And at what time was that? That was about seven o'clock on that night. All right. And that's the last conversation I had with. So that's probably as you were slipping into that diabetic coma. Yes. Okay. And then you would fall off the cliff shortly after that. Mm -hmm. and it was 12 to 14 hours later that they found you? That's right. Wow. So how did they find you? Tell, walk us through the rescue. Well, my neighbors did a search party, and uh, I happened to have a, a neighbor who was, is a hunter, and he had those good eyes. And being a hunter, he could spot things in, in woods and whatnot, and he just happened to look down and saw, by the grace of God, he looked down and he saw me. Wow. And it was because of Mike and, and, the, and the, the fact that he was the one who was there, um, it, it just you know, by the grace of God. It was just there for me. So what had happened? You just lost consciousness. You were in a coma. Your heart was still beating, but you were in serious trouble. I was. Um, I uh, had uh, a brain injury, had bleeding going on, wow. broken ribs, broken a little bit of everything, broken. Yeah, it's 40 feet. I it mean, 40 it's foot. not just the diabetic thing. It's 40 feet. Well, I mean, land, for me, it was landing on that rock, and this is where the grace of God comes in. This is where I land on the biggest, flattest rock one could ever want to find. If it had been a jagged rock, yeah. it, it would have cut me in two. I landed on the best rock anyone could ever want to find. And, and what was and around there? Was there woods or more rock? Or like? it, it's called Boulder Canyon, okay. the area where I landed. And because of uh, being Boulder Canyon, lots of rocks. And that's where I landed. And that's where my vertebrae was shattered at that point. Oh. So tell us about the rescue and the recovery. Well, the, uh, it took, I understand that it was just total chaos from that point when they found me. It was like, you know, all the messages got out to the highway that, hey, we found him. You know, we found the guy who's missing. He's right. here. And uh, just chaos took place. And, and then just the, the idea of getting me out of the woods where I was was a, a, a major undertaking by itself. Right. So they get me out of the woods with the ATV and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of men who, my neighbors who were doing, a lot of heavy lifting getting me out with the, you know, the backboard and whatnot. And uh, that's when they uh, had me, you know, took me to the Trauma One Level Center at UAB Hospital there in Birmingham. Yeah. How long was the recovery and, and what happened? Well, I stayed in the uh, NICU for close to two weeks and um, I stayed in the hospital overall for 23 days. And then I went to a uh, rehab center there at UAB and then on to another uh, rehabilitation center outside of UAB. Wow. When did you regain consciousness? Was that when they, during the rescue? No, it, uh, it actually, more like probably about four, four days later is when I recognized and knew where I, where I was. It took me that long. Uh, I was so heavily medicated that I had no idea what was going on. And, and I didn't even know until four days later that I actually had the back surgery and uh, I was that, you know, that medicated. Wow. How has this incident changed you? Or has it changed you? Well, it, it has changed me. And I mean, I just had that, just like I said, I had this whole different perspective of mankind and the love for, we you know, need more love and less hate. And, and I see that um, how everyone came together to pitch in for just me. And, and I was just devastated with that. I, I never really, I wasn't expecting anything from anyone. I never had anyone to have to pray for me before. Mm. All of a sudden, you know, I had people praying all over the world for me. And uh, I just never had to experience that. I prayed for people before, but I never had anyone had to yeah, pray for me. Yeah, because you were a Christian uh, throughout this process. But it really, the depth of the relationships really stood out to you? It did. It yeah. did. Yeah. And just the love and generosity and everything. I mean, there's a multitude of things that took place. And not only the rescue party, but the, you know, there's a donation site set up for, mm. to pay for my hospital bills because I was laid off from a job I'd had and uh, just a multitude of things like that that took place. So we read about stories like that on a fairly regular basis. I mean, you hear about people setting up funds and, and a community gathering, but tell us, like walk us through, what is it like to be the recipient of that? Just uh, really just overwhelming. I mean, I uh, did not, uh, I was just floored that that kind of outpouring of love came. And I, I really, uh, just, uh, I was really just uh, blessed to, to have that many friends and people that came together for me and my family. I mean, we were fed for you know almost three months in my house, hmm. and we didn't have to go out of the house to get any food. And and that was you know just that kind of attitude and that kind of feeling of, of just generosity and, and love. It's kind of the picture of what life should be, isn't it? It is. You, you kind of hope it is. Now we all love before and after stories. 
and we all love it when things work out perfectly, but it's the recovery, and I mean, this is two and a half years of recovery, has been challenging at times, right? For example, on the employment front, um, are you still looking for work? I am still looking for work. Uh, I've just yet to find that place where God needs me to be, and uh, you know, I wait for that for that will, you know, God's uh -huh. will to take place. How how do you not lose hope in the midst of all of that? It's just uh, I just got this great feeling of just uh, God's love, you know, just come over me, and and this entire ordeal uh, is just uh, it, it. You know, you mentioned has it changed me? It's changed a lot of things, and uh, going to the home, I, uh, the uh, the work idea that. Uh, that is part of it. And I just, you know, we all seem to think we want things here and now. As earthly people, we want something right now. Yeah. And we want it on our, yeah, yeah, we want it, we want it, what we want. And I had to decide, I had to trust God to place me where he wants me to be, not mm -hmm. where I want to be. Wow. So, so if you would have a word to people, because I know there's some listeners right now or viewers who are, struggling. They're, they're like, you know, I'm in that place. I'm trying to rebuild my life and they're losing hope. They haven't got hope. What would you say? Just, uh, I would say definitely just dig deep inside and, and find a little bit of something, a little perseverance, a little strength in your inner self. And just know that if you're still here, God still has a purpose for you. You're not just here for just to be here. Uh, we're here on this earth to provide honor and glory for him and for us to think for a minute that you know we're here now well just know that you've got there's lots of things you can be doing and there's still some hope for you if you're still kind of down there in the bottom you still got little ways to go and if that's where you are you can pick yourself up and and uh, strap on the boots and and get going well kelly garner thanks so much and if you're in a place where you know maybe you're recovering from an accident or you say wow i wish there was that kind of community around me i just want you to know there are actually people here for you we have our prayer lines whenever you're watching this whether it's during a live telecast or uh, after hours on your pvr or you're watching it online you can give us a call any time of the day or night and there are people standing there live by live to talk to you. 1-866-273-4444 are our prayer lines. And Kelly, I can't thank you enough for sharing this with us. The book is called The Night That Changed Our Lives. Kelly Garner.